Hi, welcome to Literaturely, a podcast about teaching literature. I'm Margaret Mullen. And I'm Paige Wallace. And this week we are celebrating the 100th anniversary of Women's Suffrage. Yeah, and we were just chatting about how it feels like 100 years wasn't that long ago. Yeah, I almost said 150 because of that conversation. <laughs> yeah, I feel like women, um, you know, should have been voting for the last forever. We were thinking about the timing of this episode and sort of wanted to do some exploration into this topic because we realized just on the cuff that neither of us really had any knowledge of, like, suffrage in literature uh suffrage in like the novel maybe we both had some basis of like suffragette literature right so the things that the suffragettes wrote but not anything um, with like literature like a capital l necessarily yeah and and nothing that was explored in depth in classes i think the most i ever got was like references to new woman novels like oh yeah and henry james has depictions of the new woman but nothing like that went much further than yeah that. and so even just learning that it, it felt really surprising that this was a hole that we even had yeah so we were trying to think like if we were to try to fill that hole bridge that gap what sort of courses would we want um is this something where it's like oh like these sorts of genre courses should incorporate a novel or two into their syllabus. And while that might be a goal for the future, today we're focusing more on just the question of specific courses. Like if you were to make a course about suffrage literature or literature about suffrage, what would these courses look like? What would they include? And I think it's like once Paige and I commit to an idea, we just run away with it. Yeah, <laughs> and that's so fair. we're gonna try. Yeah, we'll we'll try to keep somewhat on the lid on it today for for you all to build off of these ideas. Um, so please, please, please share any ideas you have, or if you've been taught women's suffrage and literature courses in the past, like share that experience because I'd love to hear sort of the predecessors that we could. Yeah, from. absolutely. And so, um, do we want to just start with our first one? So uh, what we're going to try to do is list off some of the courses that we brainstormed just based on the, like the literature we found and think about, well, what would the goal of that class be specifically? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we have, as Paige said, a list and we'll just work through it, I guess, of these course ideas. Um, so the first course possibility we have is suffrage and romance (laughs) yeah dramatic start yeah yeah and so I would be really excited about this class just because I want to teach a class on romance novels in general because I think that those are they're often classified as like chick lit and um like frivolous and not important and I think that thinking about uh, the role of feminism in romance novels, whether it's that, there are two ways, right? So you have like a feminist hero or a feminist protagonist in that romance novel. And a lot of times that in that situation, the genre rejects sort of all of those problematic tropes, right? Of like the dominant guy or whatever. But then the other version is the problematic uh, version of romance and the way in which it depicts suffrage as a source of like the pr- the problem source for this couple right mm-hmm. especially in historical romance women wanting equality yeah. is such a wedge in a relationship yeah <laughs> and so I think that that would be an interesting that the approach and also would be sort of the goal here that I that I would want to think about so specifically what is the romance genre how is it normally classified what are the problems in this genre and how does looking at it through suffrage um or this sort of fight for equality give itself to better understanding how the genre works yeah i don't really have too much to counter i that's what i was thinking similarly is that i would want to really think of it as a genre class so to think about like what defines a romance um and 
Also, I think, think about like audience reception. I think maybe I would want to build in this sort of course, like more work. I always talk about archives, but like the archival work of like, maybe seeing like readers of this, like what do they talk about in, in letters? Like, and that would be hard. Like you can't necessarily look specifically for references to novels, but like maybe look at author letters or letters from that time period to see like what women were writing about to their friends, but also like book reviews, again, going with like authors, um, materials, like what were the goals with this? Um, I think we talked about it when we talked about Charlotte Perkins Gilman, but how she had very specific goals. So like, we understand that authors might have like one goal when writing about uh, writing a romance novel and another goal when writing about women's suffrage. So what happens when the two collide? Um, yeah, I think that's a great question so, to consider. Yeah, so I think that would be fun to do, like to have it almost like as a research course, but grounded in <laughs> romance and suffrage. And also, you know, the depart- English departments are always telling us now, at least ours was, that we need to make sexier courses to get students to sign up for. Students will sign up for a course about romance novels. Yeah, this is true. And so then also I have like my own uh, pet project is to talk to them about how unhealthy some narratives of romance are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, shout out to Netflix's new terrible <laughs> movie. Uh, that I'm not even going to name, but is, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's fair. Um, so, I guess we'll just jump to the next course, and once we get through our list of courses, we're going to choose one to build off of and, and get a little bit more in-depth. So right now we're doing, not like, not surface level work, but intro, intro yeah. level work of when you first start thinking of a class, what are your objectives? Um, so prime or what's your primary objective? So not to rush through these, but we're just getting to the primary objective before we can get deeper into the waters of women's suffrage and literature. So, um, if you were to do a class on suffrage and global literature, what would your primary objective be? Well, I would want to think about, um, like the ways in which, like non-western feminism has influence Mm -hmm. and so thinking about how the grand narrative of feminist studies is that feminism comes from the west and Mm -hmm. sort of pushing back on that and thinking about well what in what ways does feminism come from like non-western societies and women that are looking for equality and across the world and and what does that look like and what's the history of that this is a category where I feel like I didn't find a lot of material for and a sort of blind spot for me not a problem in terms of like it existing I'm sure that it it absolutely has to I think maybe that's something you can talk about with your students too in terms of like search terms and like key terms and how when you're not as familiar with a specific conversation, it can be hard to enter it and find those resources because you don't know what they're u- what terms they're using to direct the conversation. And so, like, while suffrage, women's suffrage, or, like, suffragette is such a keystone term for um, Anglo scholars... Um, I don't know. I don't know what the key terms would be elsewhere. So, like, what were suffragists called in other parts of the world? And so that might be a way to enter that conversation. I was also thinking about that in general, like, the different timings of the movements and and goals and getting into that political rhetoric. I've done this in my comp courses, but not lit courses. But if you look at the declarations of independence, the various forms for like different countries, we we looked at the French Declaration of Independence, the Irish Declaration of Independence, and the American. And we talked about like, who are they including? Who are they not? What sort of like rhetoric are they using? Um, And the Irish one in particular is really interesting to me because it says sons and daughters of Ireland, your mother's calling to you. And it's like this very familiar rhetoric, but it really emphasizes womanhood in it and 
that then carries on into the politics, into the literature. So you get like Kathleen Nahulahan depictions come up, rise up again and, and things like that. So thinking about, I think not just like women's suffrage around the world in terms of like the women who are active and like the women led movements, but also the way women are depicted in it for global lit might be useful. Like, so what symbols were being, um, Utilized. Yeah, and just yeah. like women and like fighting for political power or political mm-hmm. say, and I was thinking about um, all those mashup videos on social media right now of images of women protesting, mm. and that would be really interesting. And perhaps even you could look do something like looking at protest signs across the world. Yeah, so I think maybe that gets to what the primary objective would be for a course like this would be something like students would be familiar with um, political movements around the world and their depictions. So thinking about those like key terms um, or like key figures and key methods incorporated. Yeah, definitely. Which would make it much more of a survey course. Yeah, I think that, that in itself could be a really interesting women in literature class. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. I would I'd really enjoy seeing like what sort of materials what else would be used because I've been thinking for both so far primary materials, but I think there's a lot to build off of there. Absolutely. Now let's move to the next category, which I know you definitely want to talk about, right? The new woman <laughs> around the world. Yeah, so the new woman around the world, like thinking, I guess it would be similar to suffrage and global lit, but a, a more specific figure. Right. So there's a um, anthology uh, of secondary criticism um, that I have that I think would be really useful for a course like this. It's called The Modern Girl Around the World. Okay. And so thinking about these different iterations of this modern girl who's always really shown as like this younger woman who's really taking control of herself and her destiny. She's going out into public life. And there are like key differences between the modern girl and the new woman and the suffragette. And so that's something maybe if we talk about it further to break down, but it's more kind of interested in girlhood on the precipice. Mm -hmm. So maybe like a, a primary objective for this course would be looking at the characterizations of modern femininity. Um, so, like, because the modern girl is often really much embodied. So maybe that would be a better name for this course, like the modern girl around mm-hmm. the world. She's not always a suffragette. She's not. Sometimes she's anti-suffragette, and that's maybe a conversation worth having. But there's a lot of interest in her her body, and because she's now can control it she can take birth control she can bring it into the public sphere she's dressing it in new ways and all of that so i think that would be fun to look at different literary portrayals of that sort of embodiment what about well so my question for that is would you begin the first day of class with britney spears as i'm not a girl not yet a woman (laughs) Mm, maybe i have used spice girls wannabe in a class before a lit class and they were horrified just just play it while they're coming in you know like don't even explain (laughs) it just play it especially because that's not one of britney's biggest hits like i think it was big for us but it's not what's like played in yeah they would be like what (laughs) what is this why is she in the desert? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think that uh, with the new woman around the world, I was thinking when you were talking about it that you're really focusing on that figure of the woman, right? In a way that's a little bit different. I think the global lit version is more community based. Is that, do you think that's that's, fair? No, yeah, I think that's true. And so would the new woman around the world also be a space to talk about queer identities and suffrage? Yeah, definitely. Because I think that's where you see kind of this rise of that sort of 
exploration because like there's more discussions about female female sexuality period and so that gives rise to thinking about like other forms of female sexuality other than just like the traditional heteronormativity yeah um so like thinking about modernist depictions of of that in general um that there's so much to mine there yeah so i i think that that would be um an interesting ad- addendum to that class and also a way to discuss uh like dominant narratives right about uh, mm-hmm. things like uh, um or like a uh, dominant narratives about the groups responsible for fighting for the, like human rights equal rights and yeah. how even in the dominant narratives of movements that really matter some voices have been erased right so like queer voices within the women's movement that might be a, a space to somehow talk about that yeah yeah no I, I agree and like also thinking about like what you said that term erase I think is so key we're thinking about how those voices might be present at the start and then as the movement becomes more dominant more mainstream they get erased and their contributions are obscured and then we unearth them and realize oh they were there the whole time and actually had much more of a voice than we realized not always just sometimes yeah. um and yeah I think that could be really cool to yeah do. and so then um I think we can move to our next one I'm, I'm I don't want you to feel like I'm rushing you but no okay. I don't feel rushed good I hope the audience doesn't either <laughs> but it's well we're to- caught we're, to tell yeah, we're, and we're co- we're covering a lot because I think that we got really excited about this topic because it was something that we didn't know any like didn't know that much about. Uh, yeah. yeah, and then realize there's so much to do, yeah. so much to do, and so little time to do it. <laughs> right. So then we've got depictions of suffrage suffragettes then and now, and so I obviously want to go back to that example that I I talked about earlier with like those mashup uh, social media videos. Mm-hmm. which are huge on TikTok right now, are the videos of women across time and place with protest signs. Um, and I think that's a really interesting sort of entryway into depictions of suffragettes then versus now. But I also think that that class could be a question or a place to question the image of the radical. That's what I would be interested in, like how we we we're taught like that doing the right thing is hard, but we always give it to historical figures who are now realized to have been doing the right things. We give this like sense of like almost sainthood and and I would say gold washing of like this sense of like oh they would have known that what they were doing was so right, no doubt. Um, those closest to them could have recognized it, like it makes it a lot more clear cut than it actually is. And I think one of the things that would be really interesting is looking at how suffragettes were constantly positioned as like hysterical or masculine in a negative sense, not non women, all of this. And then their depictions in contemporary culture is like this heroic figure and really much more of a 21st century figure than a 19th century or early 20th century figure and thinking through that. I'm not sure exactly what a primary objective would be. That maybe also ha- like it has to do with, um, you, you mentioned that sanitation of history, right? And I think then we're also connected back to the dominant narrative right and so by sanitizing Mm -hmm. history we get this larger than life hero like figure out of the suffragettes right and it sort of makes it almost taboo or at least in the past has been almost taboo to talk about the problems with that movement right the fact that there were also these like deeply entrenched issues of racism and and white supremacy within that that group of women and so yeah I think that that might be this class thinking then versus now who they were then how they're depicted now is a way of of talking through that 
Yeah, and also thinking about the failures. Like, we only talk about the successes. Like, look at what they accomplished. Look, this was their goal and they did it. But there was also a lot of goals that weren't met. Um, so looking at the suffragette novels where they're working towards those goals, um, maybe not goals that we would even support today, but I think a lot of times the suffragettes movement is watered down where it's like they wanted to wear pants yeah like i remember like did you have those picture books when you were little that was like about like the women fighting to wear yeah oh my gosh yeah yeah which obviously very important not trying to (laughs) dismiss that but just that there were also suffragettes who were like let's get rid of marriage let's (laughs) (laughs) let's overthrow the government and rethink these systems of power like where it wasn't just about you know bloomers really are you sure (laughs) yeah maybe you weren't aware (laughs) um but i think so i think some of that the difficulties of that course would be reading novels that your students would be like i don't like this i don't like the goals maybe i don't like the way it's written like not all the novels, I think, would necessarily be great or fun, but um, but also maybe not likable. And thinking about that, like the likability of a political movement. Yeah. And yeah, and I I think that that's a very interesting angle, that likability element. Uh, definitely. Yeah. So again, I'm not entirely sure how to sum that up in a clean course objective. I think it would be something like. Um, with the history of the his like this movement in literature. Um, yeah, I think you're right. But yeah, so again, kind of a survey, but not really. And you'd have to get a good balance. But um, I guess should we move on? Do we have anything else we want to say about the depictions? Then? No, I think we're solid to move forward. Good, because I'm excited to hear what you have to say about this next one. It's right up your alley of suffrage in YA. Okay, novels. yes. So let me let me prepare myself for this. I'm gonna sit up straight. <laughs> Crack your yeah. back. So listen, <laughs> I am on this soapbox that uh, there are so many genres that get classified as being less important because they're marketed largely to women and young girls. Romance is one of those, right? And so YA novels is is the other. And I, it just pisses me off, okay? Because I think that young adult novels do so much, um, like, they can be so complex and so interesting and appealing on so many levels, not just like for the pure entertainment value, but there are so many of them that are just incredibly formative I think to that sort of feminist identity that I don't like that they get glossed over as like being less important and so that's that's me I'll step off the soapbox now but I think that it's very interesting that a lot of the novels that I found when looking up this topic just like a very general Google search were young adult novels. Margaret, was that the the case with you as well? Or are my algorithms just off and they're like, she definitely is looking for young adult novels? No. So when I first started researching, I was getting a lot of lists that were clearly meant for like parents trying to find books for their daughters about suffrage, which also that was interesting that it was never like, here, your sons can Mm -hmm. read this. It was always for your daughters. I I guess this goes back to what I was talking to before about key terms. I started playing around with my key terms to see how I could get other things up. So I started using new mm-hmm. woman and that led to a lot of my rabbit holes, especially as I realized what we were talking about that novels, I think that are specifically about suffrage or, or position themselves to be specifically about suffrage tend to fall into, you know, um, genre literature. Yeah. That this is a romance novel about suff- of suffragette. This is a YA novel about the women's mm-hmm. movement. Um, but that doesn't mean that other novels aren't about women's suffrage. They're just because it's considered, I guess, a niche concern. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's more like 
this protagonist battles with questions of identity on the background of political turmoil in the early 20th century. And then you get into it, you're like, oh, women suffer. Yeah, suffered. yeah, okay. absolutely. And <laughs> so that was a great description. I really enjoyed it. Um, but I think that this class, sort of my essential goal would be to look at uh, the coming-of-age novel uh, mm. through this lens of suffrage and sort of pair it or the parallel with suffrage as a coming of age moment for feminism. That's yeah. Cool. Oh, that's actually really cool. Like, yeah, how does a movement come Yeah, And so thinking about the literature that's telling us that or, or giving us the story in which we, we're largely having like a, a, a girl protagonist who's coming of age um, and she's clearly grappling with a feminist identity and at the mm-hmm. same time what's the history of suffrage how does the movement come of age what does it mean to grapple or how did suffragettes grapple with their identity as the new woman as um, demanding equality for themselves You could do a lot of really cool secondary scholarship with, like, psychology and identity Mm -hmm. formation as well. Like, that would be really cool to think through, like, what does it mean to form an identity, to consciously form an identity? Yeah. Um, Yeah, I don't think I would necessarily do the same thing. Um, I really want to sit, like, take your class. (laughs) But I think what I would end up doing is maybe position it maybe as like a pedagogy course so like how would you teach uh these novels in a high school lit class or maybe not a middle school class i don't think i'm qualified to teach about middle school lit (laughs) but um because i've taken a a couple courses on this sort of idea i took a class on the ya novel as a pedagogy course and it was a lot about like pairing Mm -hmm. them so like doing like hunger games with 1984 which i think is increasingly becoming a trend in high school like courses and so i think you can make room where maybe you go beyond just like pairing and thinking about what you were saying Paige, of why novels not necessarily being like lesser than because they care about teenagers (laughs) teenagers right. <laughs> like um especially when we can teach things like catcher in the rye or lord of the flies and all of that without hesitation but why novels about female protagonists get a little bit more of an eyebrow right reference. why don't they have the same cultural capital right and and that's not a sweeping generalization like not all ya novels are equal but you know, so, but why is it that they automatically do not deserve any cultural capital? That's the thing that bothers me a lot. Yeah, and I think it's a fight worth having, but not a fight you could have in the next course. Well, maybe you could, but suffrage and modernism. <laughs> I would love to see a modernist YA novel. <laughs> so, um, go ahead and start writing that. <laughs> yeah. Just really marginalize the kids more. <laughs> but yeah, what are you? What would you? Oh no! Think oh no! 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 Yeah, oh, this I... is your area, <laughs> and you, Margaret, have to tell us what you would think about, like, what your goals would be for suffrage and modernism. Well, I think one of the approaches that I would do would be rethinking the canon. Mm-hmm. That the modernist canon is still so. St- stereotypically thought of as masculine that it's like defined by war all of that um and that was actually a big issue for a while like that because modernism was seen as the movement between world war one and world war two there were some schools of thought that thought women inherently could not contribute to modernism as significantly as men because they did not take part in war which ignores the fact that women were nurses, women were ambulance drivers, what? What? women are victims of what? war. It means that <laughs> like, women were being erased in this context? Wow, how surprising. <laughs> yeah, so I was thinking like that this could be a way to reconfigure the modernist canon and look at what women were writing because women were so present in the modernist movement that their male contemporaries were very much impressed most of the time with their (laughs) work. Um, It's later generations that do a lot of the erasing. Not to say that male modernist writers were champions of women's suffrage and equality, but you could do stuff with like 
um, manifestos. Oh, I would love that. Love that would be so wonderful. Manifesto. So like Mina Loy. Yeah. Yes, yes so, that's exactly what I'm thinking wow, of. Yeah. Um, You've sold me. I want to also... take it now. <laughs> Yeah, for any of you who, like, are comfortable with uncomfortable things, check out Mina Loy's um, Feminist Manifesto. But also thinking about, like, how suffrage pops up in in modernist novels. That just, like, um, for any of you who have been following conversations about pandemic literature, there was a lot about, well, no one's writing about the 1918 Spanish flu and lit. And then you had modernist writers saying, well, actually, T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland is very much influenced by that. Or we can look at this Virginia Woolf's work and think through. I think it's the same thing with suffrage, that a lot of these novels aren't necessarily thought of as being suffrage novels, but it's there. Um, So, yeah, modernist canon. Yeah, (laughs) and so, like, not to give, like, put you on the spot with that, but what's one example, that if you can think of one, of a modernist novel that's not often associated with suffrage, but that you would argue is, is about suffrage? Or at least has it, so, at least factors in in some way. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna go with one. I, I can't remember if I've talked about it before, but it's not necessarily a famous one. But Kay Boyle's *Plagued by the Nightingale*, and the reason I'd be interested in that is because there is the question of citizenship in the background and and your ability to have control mm. as a citizen. That she's an American woman and she marries a French man, and as a result, is stripped of her U.S. citizenship. That's not explicit in the novel but it's something that was understood because it was the law so thinking about as women have gained the right to vote and be full citizens they're still faced with this issue of but if you marry someone who's not american you don't get to vote you don't get to be a citizen anymore um and you if you leave this country with your husband you can't come Mm -hmm. back so that might be one i think also you could look a lot at um, Maybe James Joyce okay. and, U- and Ulysses, and think about um, as they're considering like who's a citizen, who's not. Um, you could lend that to discussions about the right to vote. Um, Storm Jameson also has a lot of political activism in her work. Um, Virginia Woolf. You could maybe think through some of her figures as like the new woman. I'm trying to think of specific scenes, but yeah, that's what's immediately coming to mind. Okay, yeah, that sounds really. Interesting. Yeah. It would you would have to do a lot of work with secondary sources to give your students a context to understand right. it. That a lot of these references are gonna be implicit. So it will be a lot of cultural capital you'd have to provide. Though you could always look at people like me and Aloy who makes it make it very explicit. Yeah, and so it would and ha, you might have said this already, but this would be more of a survey course as well, or I think it would be, that's a good question, because if you made it strictly a modernism course, I would actually love to make it just a modernism course. Okay. And so maybe this would be graduate level rather than undergraduate. Mm -hmm. I would like to have it as undergraduate, but you would be accidentally trolling a lot of male students who are signing up for a modernism course, sign up, and I'm like, wait, what? (laughs) We're not reading Hemingway? (laughs) And be like, oh, we might read Hemingway, (laughs) but not the way. Yeah. I anticipated. Well, you know, it's like that Daniel Tiger quote. You get what you get and you don't pitch a fit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You get what you get. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So what what are you thinking? If, do you have any thoughts about how you would handle suffering no. and modernism? No, I don't. Uh, no, nothing to fine. add to yours. I mean, I hadn't even thought about manifestos, but that's definitely what I would do. But I feel like... Uh, Modernism is too out of my wheelhouse to say what I might do. It's fair. And there's like... Modernism is weird. So like that class would get weird. And everyone would just have to kind of be comfortable with getting (laughs) (laughs) uncomfortable together. Yeah. But it's kind of how any modernism class is. So our last class that we're going to try to think of primary objectives for is visualizing the vote, which is, at least in my research, I don't know about you, Paige, but a lot of what I found, like, specifically about suffrage literature that wasn't um, genre-based was um, plays, that they were stage productions of suffragettes or uh, women's, the right. women's movement. And I found that really interesting, especially thinking, and throughout our whole conversation today, I've been thinking about 
um, the Meryl Streep movie that came out and how it embodies like everything we've talked about, including the problematic mm-hmm. elements of depictions of, of women's suffrage. But just as an example, that that seems to be something we're really interested in is seeing these women at work. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that uh, this offers the opportunity to have a drama-focused literature class, which, you know, I feel like is not always the case. And tends to be something that's, stri- like, restricted to the Renaissance yeah. period. Maybe restoration, but... I don't know. I, I can't think of many offerings that were modern plays that weren't like right. Yeah, yeah. And I and I think that so, that this would be a really sort of fruitful way to approach a, a, a drama class. Yeah. Um. I was trying to remember if I made a note of which ones were plays and which ones weren't, but I think there was also a number of depictions of novels, but you could do, if you suck with the theater approach, you can even like start with um, Aristotle's theory of tragedy. Oh, wow. Cause I can, yeah. And you, you know, and ask like, cause a lot of, it's even with the Meryl Streep film who she's not really the star of it. So I don't know why I keep saying her name, but that, they're depicted as these tragic stories. Like, yes, some good came out of it, but how tragic these women's lives were. And I think that would be interesting to both affirm and counter. Like, like how, like yes, these are constantly being depicted as these tragic plays, but how do they conform to a tragedy? How might they not? Go from yeah, there? and I think that a little bit different um, is Miss America, but the way Miss America ends with dealing with the tragedy of like the ERA not passing yeah and I think there's also now that I'm thinking about it like part of Aristotle's definition of like a a successful tragedy is that like the characters all reflect their positions and so working through that about how these are narratives of people challenging positions Mm -hmm. and and how does that work um and how does that evolve culturally um, in these yeah yeah that would be a really um fun cl- class and I think also maybe a way to talk about this is again a little bit different but uh, the sort of like oral traditions that are associated with uh, the suffragettes right mm-hmm. so like giving speeches and yeah. how <sighs> we when we come upon these texts we're reading them right and so mm-hmm. we're we there's something lost to the power of the voice when we're just reading them and so that's why people actresses will recreate these speeches not for any particular like like movie project or anything but like just for an a youtube audience or something and yeah Yeah. and so that that might be something to pull in as well yeah and then you could also really think about the lived experience versus the depicted experience because we've talked about in the past but sojourner's truth speech ain't i a woman where that's not the way it was delivered but they felt it didn't reflect the position that she would hold as a former slave a black woman that they had to focus yeah and now Um, we're back to the dominant narrative right yeah all all full circle so i guess since we're full circle do we want to pick one of these courses to break down and think about what texts we'd include or what sort of assignments. Yeah, so I think we can also say if as long as you're comfortable with it, Margaret, we have this list Mm -hmm. of uh, novels about suffrage broken down into like 20th versus 21st century that we could post as a resource. Yeah, definitely. Um, And we could always post it as a shared Google Doc with the edits on, so that crowdsource some other examples for it Mm -hmm. i think that we do have time to kind of quickly talk through one of these and some of the the texts we might use so what do we want to choose margaret um well i'm gonna take modernism off the table oh i thought you were gonna (laughs) i thought you're gonna alex trebek me you know and be like i'm gonna take modernism for 100 Uh oh (laughs) <laughs> it's an 800 I, is that is that one of the numbers I that, it leave it to a modernist okay 
Okay. Um, maybe we could do, I would say, either, like, New Woman Around the World or Depictions of Suffragettes, since we have, I think, some of those resources more ready to us at the yeah. moment. And it's a little bit more open-ended. Yeah, yeah. I say we, let's do um, Depictions of Suffragettes then and now. Okay, cool. Um, so we've kind of talked around this, and I think we both want to make this explicit off the bat that you would really want to make do work to make sure you are not just doing like white depictions of this for the then or now <laughs> like you really and and you also want to make sure that you wouldn't be tokenizing like have one book that's about right. race and wash your hands right. of it. Which is definitely hard, and that's something I think you'd have to be upfront with your students about, that, like, this narrative, the dominant narrative has been primarily white, but that doesn't mean the contributions were primarily white. Absolutely. And so, if you started this class, like, or you were thinking about organizing it, would you organize it around specific figures, specific events? Mm. What would you, like, how would you group things? I think it would be somewhat Mm topic-based or, like, issue-based, I should say. So, like, I was thinking about, like, maybe, like, the issue of marriage Mm -hmm. and have, like, a then and now take on it. Like, how suffragists were thinking about marriage or women in the workforce. Mm -hmm. And so, like, I am using kind of a loose understanding of suffrage because I do think there's a lot of overlaps Mm -hmm. um, and... And to have students kind of think that through. And maybe, like, also having, like, you know, the issue of, like, the community woman. Because just while we were talking, I was thinking, that's a modernist novel that is not directly about suffrage. But um, Nella Larson's passing. And thinking through, like, that they're both... Irene more so is an act, like a... She's a charity circuit woman. She raises money for organizations, specifically like organizations like the NAACP. So how is that tied to the suffrage movement? Or, and and then like versus you could think like how there's other sorts of like these charity circuit women. So like almost like the, I guess in that case, I'm thinking about like the emphasis on social and social activist, like for movements to gain momentum and to get resources there has to be a social yeah. component. on it so like how does the suffragette manage that and make it well and i also think that touching on or connected to passing is the way in which or, or could be a conversation about the the way in which you're seen in society and specifically how the suffragettes are thinking about uh, they want to be seen as agents of political power, right? To have the political power to vote. Um, but black women have a different relationship with power and the way in which the political machine sees them, the legal machine sees them. And so I think there is also a way to bring in something like Kimberly Crenshaw's intersectionality, right? With the tie to a court decision said you can't be discriminated against as a black woman because this factory hires black men and white women. So you're somehow in this non-space um, in a way that mm. takes away power, right? Uh, power to be seen from your positionality. And that is something I think could be a larger part of a class like this. Yeah, and I think thinking about spaces, like maybe that's another approach you could do with the then and now. Like, where are the the feminist spaces and suffragette spaces? So, thinking like secondary source Nancy Armstrong's, um, some call it fiction, talks about how like politics begin in the home. She's responding. Um, oh shoot, who's she responding to? I want to say Foucault, but don't hold mm-hmm. me to that. But she's thinking through, like, how your identity, you go home, and it's formed kind of in private. You bring the public space into it so that these these novels about – these domestic novels like Jane Eyre or Wuthering Heights are actually incredibly political. And I think that's something else you could think about, like, those, those sorts of then and now that um, we look back and we think of these novels as old-fashioned and quaint – 
when really they're working through these significant political issues of like colonialism <laughs> or um and so thinking and then you could bring that in what you were talking about page of like well who's and who's allowed mm-hmm. in these spaces who's excluded from these spaces um how do these spaces restrict their movement like that um so that could be cool and i'm thinking of like now like what sort of assignments that i want them to do um and i think i'd have to think through this a little bit more but i'm i'm keeping haunted by the image throughout this of um mrs banks from mary poppins sister suffragette um where she's marching around in that ruffly dress and we're supposed to find her somewhat silly, I think. I don't know how many little girls really actually found her silly. I think when you're little, you're like, yeah, <laughs> look at her doing this stuff. And then as an adult, you rewatch the movie and you're like, oh, the movie's positioning her as like neglecting her children and being out of touch. But maybe there's something there where like students can look at depictions and assess like that as a, as a presentation, um, like the visual representations throughout the 20th century. I, for, for the, yeah, yeah, I think you could also uh, use it as a reflective assignment of some sort. So have them um, create uh, like some sort of visual representation at the beginning of the semester. Like what does a suffragist look like to you? It could even be something like a collage. Give me a collage of Mm -hmm. what the suffragette is and what the issues that she cared about or or sort of uh, advocated for. And then at the end of the semester, if you redo that collage, what does it look like? That would be really cool, actually. And thinking about, especially, like, what does the suffragette care about? And see how that evolves and changes. Yeah, so is it just about wearing Um, pants? (laughs) Yeah. Right. Well, and then you could bring in, like, the political cartoons, right, uh, that showed suffragettes, like, that, you know, is big and domineering and, like, you know, like, monstrous. Yeah, and then hyper-masculine. And small and feminine. Yeah. yeah. And, and think through that. And also, we haven't talked about this, but um, it came up for me in Irish lit classes because we had to look at a lot of, like, political cartoons about the depictions of Ireland as a woman. Um, so she's Hibernia, and then um, England is uh, uh, Britannia. And I remember wondering, like, huh, like, that's so weird. How come, um, like, the United States doesn't have, like, a female representation? And then I realized she does. It's Columbia, which you can see in Columbia Pictures, the woman holding the torch. But we don't use her as a political symbol anymore because the suffragettes adopted her. And they would dress up as her in their marches. And it became this feminist symbol. Yeah. And everyone else stopped using it except for columbia pictures and so that's also then a class that we haven't even talked about in terms of thinking about like how like icons and the way they're used and so that's maybe more of like that's something that could work really well in a comp class i think yeah but even in the then and thou that's another you could do a semester long project where this would require you to do a lot of work up front but like go through the text you're working with and see which sort of symbols and iconography or visuals come up again and again in the novels and whatever else you're using and then ask students to select one of those and they like trace its history yeah as you go through them and how how is it used originally how does it get adapted does it get erased does it get reconfigured that's um, a really thinking awesome like, final paper yeah, I think it'd be really fun, if, and especially if they're working on it throughout the mm-hmm. semester, so it's not that throwaway paper of, I don't know, I found these three sources, but this really long-term consideration of how do feminist symbols evolve or get Yeah, worked. yeah, and so I, I think that we could talk about this forever, so mm-hmm. I we should move to our dream course, and I kind of want to, I keep, I feel like I'm always uh, switching it up on you with the dream course at the last minute but I want you now that we've discussed all of these classes what would your dream course be like uh, your dream suffragette course well I was thinking with modernism and the new woman and all of that I think it would be something like the suffragette in public life and it would be more early 20th century modernist texts. So thinking like Henry James, um, 
and his characters that aren't necessarily suffragettes but are entering the world and wanting a little bit more and then how that evolves so it's like women enter the public world they're also entering public life which means voting um, and how that takes us up through I would probably say like 1930s I think World War II brings like new political concerns that at least temporarily side sideline um, suffrage mm-hmm. and, um, and and the feminist movement suffrage I, I know was already <laughs> accomplished so yeah I would like to think through that and I brought up Storm Jameson before but she just has a really interesting novella called a, a single heart where it's a woman who is growing up amidst all this but she, what she dreams of is being the woman behind the scenes like she wants a man who's masculine and powerful and can be a leader but she wants to be the one who's cultivating that power behind the scenes and um so she's involved in all sorts of like public work and all of that but it's interesting so i think that would be a way maybe to end the class and start thinking about the move back towards like nuclear family traditional values and like what that yeah but um, well, I was thinking a, a lot about, um, like, abolitionist literature and suffrage. Mm. And so, again, not something that we touched on, but I think it's related to this idea of suffrage it's then and now. And so it might be a way of considering uh, the genre of protest literature and really sort of mm-hmm. narrowing in on this idea of suffrage and then versus now. And then what's the relationship between early or even later abolitionist and early suffragettes is there one do we see it what kind of critical conversations could we have and like that sort of gatekeeping that happens in movements that what sort of identity do you have to perform who do they want and how that is constantly pushed further of oh you're doing it well actually we want this exactly yeah so I, th- I'm ready to teach this, some of these classes now. I know. And I'm, and again, a reminder, we'll share our list because we compiled a pretty long list of novels. And as we said, it's kind of hard to just Google suffrage in novels because you're going to get children's books. You're going to get a lot of contemporary works, not necessarily works written by people living through the suffrage movement. Um, and if you have resources, please add to it because this is by no means exhaustive. Yeah, definitely. Okay. But other than that, yeah, I'll talk to you later. All right, see you, Margaret.